Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Oh, Jesus is calling. Oh, have you come to the end of yourself? Oh, do you thirst for a drink from the well? Oh, Jesus is calling. And oh, come to the altar. And the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes Oh, come today, there's no reason to wait Oh, Jesus is calling Oh, bring your sorrows and trade them for joy Oh, from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling No, come to the altar And the Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ So what a Savior, and isn't he wonderful? Oh, sing alleluia, oh, Christ is risen. Oh, bow down before him, oh, for he is Lord. And oh, come to the altar, and the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, and the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. cross as you wait for the crown oh, tell the world of the treasure you found oh, from the rising of the sun to the ending of the day one name alone be praised Every nation, tribe, and tongue, all creation lifting up. Your name alone we raise. Praise the Lord, all the earth, all the earth. Bless His name, only one name, thou and Jesus, you have rescued us. You are good and you are just. One name alone be praised. Oh, from
from the heights and from the depths, in every heart with every breath, your name alone we raise. Praise the Lord, all the earth, all the earth. Bless His name, only one name, now and always. And every sky is filled with wonder, all creation lifting higher. like our God, oh, who is like our God, say, every sky is filled with wonder, oh, all creation lifting higher, the only King who reigns forever, who is like our God, oh, who is like our God, sing, praise the Lord, all the earth, all the earth, oh, bless His name. Only one name, now and always. Praise the Lord, all the earth, all the earth. Oh, bless His name, only one name, now and always. Oh, bless His name, only one name, now and always. You are our hope and our refuge. As we hear from your word this morning, we make ourselves available to your spirit's work in us. Lord, challenge us. Lord, draw us nearer to you. Amen. Good morning, West Village. My name is Jonathan, and I'm a church planter and the pastor of Église Résurrection Church in Rigo, Quebec. For those of you who might not know where Rigo is, it is between Ottawa and Montreal. And uh, we have moved to Rigo in August to start a church plant. And uh, by God's grace, we were able to start our first service in the month of November on the 29th, which is the first Sunday of Advent in the Christian calendar. So basically the first day of the Christian year, and um, which, is what, which was just over a month ago. And it's an honor for me to be with you this morning. Just as we begin, I ask that uh, you would bow your hearts with me in prayer as we ask the Lord's blessing upon our time. Oh well, Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy that are new with us every morning. And Lord, as we begin this new year, I pray that you would speak to us particularly through your word, the words that you had inspired by your Holy Spirit uh, through uh, the diverse writers, through your word written, and uh, this, this morning through your servant, David. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would bless us, that you would give us uh, hearts to receive your word with with joy and gratitude, and uh, that you would uh, incline our hearts to obey your word as well. I pray that you bless us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's an honor and privilege for me to open God's word with you this morning and to greet you into this new year. 2020 was a very difficult year. Uh, it was difficult for us as a society, as churches, for families, for individuals. And many of us in Canada and around the world are hoping to turn the page uh, now that we are in the year 2021 to a new and better year. Now, if I were an optimist, I would say, well, the, the year 2021 is looking to be the best year yet. Uh, we're going to build back better and it's going to look fantastic. If I were a pessimist, on the other hand, I would probably say, uh, no way, that's not going to happen. Things are just going to get worse. And if you know, if I were a realist, I might say something to the effect of, I have no idea what the year will bring. And we need all three people. Uh, I don't know where you stand this morning, but we need all three people. Uh, but one thing that proved especially difficult in this past year, which will certainly carry over uh, into the new year, into this year of 2021, is how we dealt with what is commonly referred to as mental health or depression, in other words. Uh, many people have faced the reality of depression uh, like no other time in their lives. And for some, it might have been for the first time. While for others, uh, it was just like this lingering force that avalanched over them. And uh, again, I don't know where you stand, where how your year was. And wherever you may be on the spectrum of experience, you might wonder, 
How will I navigate 2021? How will I climb out of depression and into happiness? Like, is that even an option for me? Well, I want to invite you to look at the at God's Word written, written with me this morning. Uh, we're going to look at Psalm 32, because I think it's going to invite us to look at this very question of how do we deal in this, in this world where depression exists and where God exists and, and, and how do I fit in all of this? And hopefully this will give you tools to, to stay the course in the year 2021, uh, to give you great confidence in the Lord and to walk with him with great joy and happiness, uh, despite the different storms that may be ahead of us. So I invite you to turn, turn with me to Psalm 32, and I'm going to read verse 1 and 2, just to begin. So it says, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. We'll pause here for a second. Uh, so the opening words here are blessed, blessed. Uh, David is, is saying, blessed is this person, uh, the one against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, whose sins are forgiven, and so on. So, so the words of blessing are the opening words here. And the English translation here doesn't exactly convey the exuberance of this word, the force behind it. It's basically trying to say, exceedingly happy is this person. Like, all the happiness in the world is, is, belongs to this person who is forgiven and who's, you know, who, who, with whom the Lord counts, does not count their, their iniquity and so on. And, uh, you know, for, for some of us who are Christian and might have been Christian for a long time, we maybe kind of tune out. You know, these are very familiar words. Let's just be honest. We, we hear these words and, and uh, it's just kind of presented to us. But there, there isn't much... I don't know, maybe it's just me. <laughs> They're wonderful words when we unpack them, but just reading them on the surface doesn't seem like there's much, you know, meat to chew on. Uh, but uh, we're going to look at that. We're going to unpack that in a second. And maybe you're an objector here this morning. Maybe you're, you're here, you know, let's just imagine you're an objector right next to me. And you might say, yeah, but Christians are happy or, or tend to be happy only because they are naive. Like forgiveness, iniquity, covering, like these are all very religious words and religious jargon that, that disconnects you from reality. Let's just be honest here. Um, and, uh, you know, you might even wonder, like, don't you, or might even say, object, don't you know that it's so hard to find happiness because life is difficult and harsh sometimes. Like, don't you know that people are depressed and anxious in life? Wow, well, that's a very good, very good point, very good question or objection. And, uh, you know, if this wasn't a hypothetical conversation, I would be able to say, yes, yes, I do know that life is, is harsh, life is difficult. Depression was something that's, you know, very uh, important in my walk with the Lord. Uh, even before I became a Christian, I, I just lived in this, this swamp of depression that I was not able to get out of. And even after being a Christian, I've still experienced depression. And so, yes, I, I do know. I do know that this is, this is something that is very real in this life, that, uh, that depression is real, that life is, is difficult and harsh. And it's not just me. Well, the, I mean, the government of Quebec, where, where I live now, uh, projects that around 20% of, of Quebecers experience depression regularly. And let's be honest here, that's a very low projection. People don't always know how to detect their depression, and sometimes people are too proud to even admit that they're depressed. So the number would be even higher than 20%, and that's a big number. And, well, most don't even know how to, how to even navigate this question. So, let, so let's, let's consider this. Climbing out of depression and into happiness is a very common struggle for people. That's, that's just the reality of, of, of the life that, in the world where we, where we live. A couple of years ago, there was a song that became very, very popular here in Quebec. And, uh, well, I, I heard it in Ottawa because I used to live in Ottawa before I moved uh, to Rigo. And uh, it was it would play on the radio. I mean, it had over 40 million clicks in the first year. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a song called Il est où le bonheur? Where is happiness? And in this song, uh, Maillet, who is the singer, uh, Christophe Maillet, is seen as sort of a sage who's experienced everything under the sun. 
Um, and he knows, after he's experienced everything, he knows that happiness, as desirable as it is, can never really be harnessed. You can't really attain happiness. And the punchline in this song is, um, and I'll translate it, he says, happiness is stupid because it's usually only after the fact that we realize it was there. In other words, if you experience happiness, by the time you realize that you're happy, it's already gone. So happiness is elusive. And if this is true, if happiness is really elusive, just like Maie describes it, does the Bible lead people into silliness and naivete by telling them that they can truly be happy like we see in verses 1 and 2? while dismissing the reality of depression? How does that work? Well, let's look at verses three and four as uh, David unpacks that for us. He provides a bit of context and opens up a little bit about his life. So let's, let's read that, verses three and four. He says, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Well, let's pause here. That's a depressed man. I don't know if you noticed. Uh, if you've been d depressed, you, you understand what he's going through. I, I remember reading this for the first time uh, and realizing, wow, like how vivid of a description is that? My bones wasting away. Like I I felt that. Uh, and what we see here uh, is um, that, uh, that, that David is experiencing... You know, the silence, he's experiencing isolation uh, within himself, fear and withdrawal, uh, bones wasting away. That's inner physical numbness due to the various chemicals that are being released from, from being in a situation where you're, you're afraid and you're trying to preserve yourself and groaning all day long in the psychological and, and emotional pain that, that he's experiencing and the heaviness sensing unsurmountable and constant pressure and this having a strength dried up you can just imagine the loss of vitality just the feeling of being sapped uh, from your energy and what we see is, is that the bible is actually not silly not silly when it comes to talking about depression but acknowledges that, that it's real and acknowledges it in a graphic way so while the, the bible does open up the topic of, of happiness as we saw in verses one and two it situates the potential of happiness in a world where depression truly exists, where depression truly exists. I remember hearing um, a, uh, a Christian counselor saying that uh, it's actually surprising that we're not more depressed than we actually are. If we think about it, and we're, we're going to unpack that a little bit more, but it's, I mean, for, for atheists, they have to account for that as well. Like what like we, we live in a world where, you know, where depression exists and, well, it's, it only seems natural that it, that it would be that way. Now, in, in any case, I'm going to unpack that a little bit more. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but um, basically any Christian who says that you can't be depressed, that, that it's impossible for a true Christian to experience depression and anxiety, is, uh, well, this text refutes that idea. <laughs> this text, along with the other New Testament uh, texts that call us to cast our anxieties upon the Lord, uh, this refutes that, that idea. Christians can be depressed. Uh, that's just the reality of how uh, the Bible depicts depression in our human experience. Now let's read verse uh, 3 and 4 again. Uh, because, well, I, I'm not a, a clinical psychologist or an expert, but I speak from, from personal experience. In verses 3 and 4, they, they unpack that reality of, of depression. And, you know, we, we know that depression is, is caused from all sorts of different all sorts of different spheres, like, you know, or maybe a psychological uh, imbalance or, or uh, maybe it's uh, emotional, maybe it's physical, uh, social, all of these, these fears, these spheres um, where, where depression can be caused. But there's an underlying sphere that this text right here in the verses three and four is going to unpack for us. It's a sphere from which all of depression ultimately stems from. So let's look at that again. I'll just read verse 3. It says, For when I kept silent, for when I kept silent. Uh, pause there for a second. Uh, this is this is very big. You know, if, if we were to, to double click on that, that word and uh, a window were to open up, 
it would open up the, the idea or the theme of the opening pages of Scripture, uh, where, you know, God created us for, for, for relationship with himself. And keeping silent is a sign of a broken relationship. Uh, and you can think of in Genesis 3, where, where Adam and Eve sinned against God. They, they didn't obey his word. They, they sought their own autonomy. And when they realized that they were naked and, and guilty and felt the shame of what they had done, they hid from the Lord. They kept silent from the Lord. And uh, now in case some of you might be thinking this is a bit of a, a narrow way of thinking of depression, like is that really the ultimate sphere of, of our depression? Like that sounds a little bit fundamentalist or I don't know how you might be thinking about this, but I want to share this quote by J.R.R. Tolkien with you, which will hopefully broaden our categories a little bit for understanding how depression does ultimately stem from our separation from God, as we see in Genesis chapter 3. So here's the quote by Tolkien. He, he says, and this is from one of his letters, We all long for Eden, and we are constantly glimpsing it. Our whole nature, at its best and least corrupted, its gentlest and most humane, is still soaked with a sense of exile. Now what a powerful quote. What a powerful quote. He's saying that you, we, we are made for a place like Eden, a paradise-like environment, and the implication is in the presence of God, the God who made Eden. We're meant for that place where beauty and truth and goodness just overflow in a perfect harmony. And yet we're exiled from that place. And it's like if we have in the memory of our DNA, there's, there's just this magnetic pull towards Eden, that there, there, this Eden, this place ought to be, it ought to exist, it ought to be true. And, um, you know, the Christian worldview is not just, you know, me and God in, in, a, in a type of vacuum, but it's, it's me and God in this, in this world. And so it makes sense that, you know, if, if we are in a broken relationship with God and in a broken relationship, uh, and therefore in a broken relationship with the created order and, and with human beings, that it, it makes sense that, that we would experience depression the way that we do, the way that we, we really do, that it's not just, you know, one-sided, but it's actually multifaceted. Our experience of depression is not just a, a chemical imbalance in our minds, but it's actually, you know, brokenness all around us, uh, social brokenness and and uh, relational brokenness, emotional brokenness, physical and uh, psychological. And so what, what Tolkien is saying, and, and, and he's capturing some of the essence of the Christian worldview, is that there is something about the hard wiring of human beings that says we belong in a world like Eden, in the presence of our maker and in his kingdom, but we are truly exiles instead. And according to the creation account of the Bible, God made everything so that there would be a happy harmony between himself, a harmony between himself, the world and human beings that resembles the very eternal and happy harmony between the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. That, that is how uh, it is depicted, uh, that uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together, three persons, one God, created the world for a perfect harmony. And in Genesis 3, these relationships became broken when human beings elevated their autonomy and sought, the, sought their own authority apart from God. Every other relationship was broken and cursed from there. And every human being is born into this mess. And, and, and it's not that, that we're just passively born into this mess, but we, we take it upon ourselves. We seek our own autonomy. We seek our own authority in life. And, and we make it our own mess. And this is the beginning of depression in human history. Everything kind of crumbles from there on. And uh, let's just take a, a moment to pause here. Uh, because I want to look in, 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 in a deeper philosophical question. For those philosophical types, I'm not this great philosopher by any means, but I do like apologetics in some way. And uh, to my knowledge... You know, this story, this Christian story is the best story to, or the best way to account for depression and the way that we experience it because of this very important claim that depressed people make all the time, at least, at least silently in their hearts. We, if you've been depressed, you've, you've at least thought this, things are not as they should be. You've thought those words, or you might have said them. Things should not be this way. Things ought not to be this way. 
Now let me ask this. How can a world where blind chance and pitiless indifference, to put it in uh, Dawkins, uh, and, and Dawkins' words, and Darwinian and atheistic evolution, uh, how can this world of blind chance and pitiless indifference account for this idea that things should be a certain way or ought to be a certain way uh, as our intuitions insist? Like, how does that work? And yes, I understand that there are ways in which our intuitions are formed by our culture and time uh, so that we have certain expectations that are, that are really shaped by our, our cultural moment. That's true, but there are other intuitions that are far more transcendent and metaphysical than just those temporary, you know, I, I have expectations as a, as a Canadian male, white, uh, maybe middle, lower class. I know I'm wearing a nice suit. It was on sale. Um, but uh, I have certain expectations about how the world should be. But, but there are deeper ones as well, deeper layers of, of expectations and intuitions that, that call out and say, the world is not the way it should be. And so we long for Eden, and yet we're soaked with a sense of exile. Things are not how they ought to be. So let's notice again uh, that it says in the text, in verse 3, right, that it says, I kept silent. And this recalls the Garden of Eden where human beings hid from God, just as I mentioned earlier, after disobeying God's word and rebelling against God's authority. And, uh, and it's from there that everything kind of crumbles and we experience depression because of our own actions and our own inactions. Uh, it's passive and active. That's, that's how we experience depression because of our, our, our thoughts, our words, and our, and our actions were, are broken. They're hostile to God. But I also, I also want to acknowledge and that uh, depression is, or our experience of depression can also be caused because of what others have done. And uh, because of other people's actions and inactions, you know, it might be violence or, or sexual abuse, a controlling or manipulative boss or spouse or parent or child, uh, unfair pay, racism, harassment, etc., etc. Um, people who are victims of such evil can experience depression as well. But even for victims, even for victims of such hurts, the question is always set before us. Will we draw closer to God for comfort and counsel in how we should proceed from, from there? And, you know, maybe for some of you, it's, you know, in some cases, it's seeking justice. Will you, will you turn to the Lord? Will you draw near to the Lord, draw closer to the Lord? Or will you resort to your own devices and sort of recoil and, and turn into yourself and seek comfort and licking your wounds? And um, don't mean to, to offend, but... That's, um, that's often what we do, isn't it? And not only that, but that, that's in our inactions, but in our actions, we try to seek revenge in manipulative ways. And friends, we have to turn to the Lord, even as victims, even as, uh, as victims of hurt, we need to turn to the Lord. And uh, we're called to draw near to him. And we are called to draw near to the God who hardwired you for a relationship with him in the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Eden with him. So, Okay, now there's still a big question that uh, might loom over our heads. Where is God in all this? You know, where is God in all this? It's not like, is it just that I, I keep silent and, and I feel like the, the forces of nature are just all out of whack so that I feel depression? Like, how does, where, where's God in all this? And, and maybe, you know, you're wondering if you're, if you're familiar with Islam, you're maybe wondering, like, is God so distant and transcendent that he doesn't actually relate to, to this situation of depression that I experienced? Like, is he so far away? Or maybe for, if you're from a Hindu background, like, is, uh, you know, the Supreme God sort of hidden behind the illusory veil of the universe and our experiences, even our experience of depression, so that we need to get rid of our, de our, 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 our depression so that we can access God? Or is it more like, you know, the, the Buddhist gods who are, in the various heavens and require that we detach ourselves from, from our desires and detach ourselves from the pain that we experience so that we can sort of enter into his presence or his presences uh, because they have various gods. Like, how does it work? Well, that's a very good question. Like, where is God in, in, in our depression? Let's look at verse four, because I think this is going to give us a very important clue here. 
so verse 4 says, For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. God's hand was heavy upon David. Now that might not be, <laughs> that might put us off a bit or it might surprise or shock us a little bit. Like God's hand in some way is causing David's depression. Uh, in some way, not maybe not completely. Maybe it's also, you know, other, other things, but his hand is active. And uh, we might be wondering, wow, like I never, never heard of that. I like, guess, is, is that really true? Like, is that how it works? And the answer is yes. And I'll unpack that in a second. Uh, and and what, is try, what this is trying to say is that this is a sign of God's righteous judgment on our sin. Remember that David is keeping silent from God. He's withdrawing from God um, and uh, resorting to his own self, to his own devices, to his own authority and autonomy. And so, uh, so yes, God's righteous hand is upon him and it's causing him to feel dry like in the summer like in the heat of summer it's heaviness upon David and it's not just that we are separated from God but we also are deserving of of God's judgment for not worshiping him in full transparency so how does that work like does the bible speak of God's hand at being uh, like or rather does, doesn't the bible speak of God's hand being for us in battle like how does that work is, is God sort of divided among himself is there like one hand for battle that is for us and the other hand uh, is against us like what is going on uh, I'll, I'll give this analogy and I hope this, this will be able to clarify things a little bit but um, I have a two-year-old son and as a dad I, I there are moments where I'm just so proud of him you know he he'll build a tower or he'll you know He'll sing a song or something, and I just, I just want to rejoice over him. And so I put my hand on his shoulder and say, like, wow, great job. Like, I'm so happy with you, happy for you. And there are other times when, you know, I, uh, when he's about to, to, you know, he's walking on something, he's about to walk on ice, uh, and, um, and I know that he doesn't have very good balance because uh, he's just two. He doesn't really know how to walk on ice yet. So I take my hand and I pull him away from the ice just to protect him. And there are other times when, you know, when he does something silly or something he shouldn't be doing and, uh, and he knows that I'm coming to, to, to inquire of him and, uh, and I call his name and, and he'll, he'll start to, to walk away, start to squirm and, and run, try to hide. And I put my hand on his shoulder and say, hey, get back here. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I think this is what the hand here or the hand motif in the in the Bible is 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 related to. I mean, God is our Father, our Heavenly Father. He's a perfect Father. I'm a fallen Father. I'm a fallen Dad, but uh, but God is perfect, and He treats His His people, His covenant people, as His children. And God puts His hand on on His shoulders sometimes to protect, to affirm, to rejoice, and sometimes to uh, call back to Himself in moments where we're where we're running away, where we're hiding from him, uh, where we know that, that we deserve God's justice, where we deserve God's wrath. And, and God puts his hand upon us and presses upon us, uh, not so, 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 so to crush us, not so to crush us, but to call him back, to call us back to himself, to draw us near to him, to say, my child, come back. I, I need to talk with you. I need you to understand that what you're doing it's not right. I want you to turn to me and find your refuge in me. I think this is what it's, it's what David is conveying here. Um, and so, you know, we, just like David, experience depression. We experience God's hand in our depression. And if it wasn't for God's hand in our depression, if it wasn't for this text, I would not have felt God's mighty hand in my life. When I was depressed, a university student in downtown Montreal, studying music, which was my idol, uh, and and God called to me, and 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 it wasn't just like He snatched me out, and I didn't experience any you know pain of my depression. He actually allowed me to taste the, the sourness of my of my own desires, my own idols, uh, and to, to to see how just not life giving. 
the path that I was treading was, was leading me to. And so he put his hand upon me and I felt dryness. So, so dry, I could not de deny it. So dry that I, I needed salvation. And I needed salvation that, that I, I still remember the feeling of being so sapped. And yet God providing this, this comforting hand, drawing me to himself and calling me to, to repentance and to, to faith and to believe in him. And this begins to answer, you know, the, the question of why we planted a church uh, here in Quebec, even in COVID. Like, why is it that we did that? Well, because in a time when people are suffering from depression, surely God is sovereignly stretching out his hand and laying upon Quebecers. And even for you in Ottawa and Gatineau, that God is calling people to himself, leading them to a place where, where they need to decide to follow him. That, that seems to be the way of scripture, the way that, that God deals with people, uh, even in times and moments uh, of pandemics and epidemics and even in COVID. And so our great hope, you know, it's not that, it's not that, you know, we, we relate to, that we can relate to people who have depression. Hope is not in that, you know, there's comfort in knowing that you're not the only one, but the hope is not in that. And our hope is not that we have, you know, as Christians, we have practical steps on how to you know, walk uh, our lives, uh, so to avoid depression or, or something like that, or or even just the fact that God stretches out his hand. Like, that's not my, my hope. My hope is in the gospel. My hope is in Jesus Christ, who is God that is not just a hand that stretched out, but he himself came down. He came down from his heavenly throne, as Philippians chapter 2 describes. He did not just hold on to the glory that was due to him, but he came down, left his glory aside, entered into our frail humanity. He lived a perfect life, a perfectly righteous life, and is the only one who can lift God's righteous hand of judgment. That God's judgment is no longer over me in an ultimate way. Although sometimes when I do sin, God calls me back to himself and he, he reveals to me certain sins so that I would repent and turn to him. But ultimately, I, I, I am... I am no longer separated from God because Jesus came to me and came to you. And, I'm, and we're no longer under God's wrath, God's judgment, because Jesus took it upon himself. That's why he came. That's why he died on the cross, to take God's wrath upon himself, God's, God's uh, judgment over sin, over my sin and over yours, so that, you know, we can turn to him. We can turn to him and have the very fundamental cause of our depression be mended and healed. And it's not that we're never going to experience depression anymore. We still live in a fallen world, in, in a world that is hostile. We, we still need to learn to walk, you know, with God and, and, and with, you know, in, in light of our salvation. We need to learn to walk in this world of things and, and to be disciples and to, to walk with other people and to learn how to, to walk in that. And even, even then, we still will experience some form of depression. But our ultimate source of depression, which is separation from God, and the, the wrath of God is dealt with at the cross. And that is our ultimate hope. That is my ultimate hope. So that I know that one day uh, that Jesus will, you know, return. At, he's, he's ascended. He's gone to the Father. And he will return to establish his throne so that happiness and joy and, and perfect righteousness will rule. And depression will be no more. That's, that's my hope. That's what keeps me going. That's what... That's what keeps me going in this life. That's what, uh, that's what launched us into planting a church. It's this hope that Jesus is very real. He, he really uh, changes our, my life. He really changes our lives. And that he gives us hope for one day that all of our longings and yearnings will be met in him, in his presence, in his kingdom, with his people. And what do we have to do from now on? I mean, what do we have to do first to come to Jesus, to be, you know, if you're, if you're not a Christian and, and, and you want to come to Jesus, uh, well, it's in verse 5 that, that we are given the steps. And it's not just for the first time that we come to Jesus, but it's when we, when we come to him, you know, walk, uh, uh, as we walk as Christians, we will experience depression and, and, and we will uh, fall into sin and we will run away from God or whether it's the... Uh, you know, the, the, the millionth time that we come to him for comfort and for grace. The answer is in verse 5. So let's, 
Let's read that. In verse 5, it says, and David is speaking here in the first person. He says, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I acknowledge my sin to you. He's not silent anymore. David's not silent anymore, and neither should we be. I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. And the idea here of, of covering, you know, it's kind of like Adam and Eve, with uh, they, they covered themselves with fig leaves. Um, and um, it's kind of like for us, it's kind of covering ourselves with good deeds or, you know, with masks, you know, the, the not not the, the, the masks that you wear to go to the store, but, but with facades and with, you know, we want to look better than we are. David is throwing all of that away, his reputation, his status, uh, social status, and, you know, trying to look good in the eyes of others, casting that away. Because God is the one who provides the sacrifice. God is the one who provided Jesus to cover us. Uh, the perfect righteousness of Christ covers all of those who put their trust in him so that we can stand in the presence of God. And so I, I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Wow. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful that there can be true and meaningful reconciliation in the ultimate relationship that, that, that counts the most? The relationship between creature and creator. Uh, like that's amazing. And uh, this, you know, if you were to ask, what is David's sin? We wouldn't know. Uh, look back in verses 3 and 4 on your own time and, and try, to, try to discern what is David's sin. We don't know. And there's a reason for that. It's a literary device that, uh, that David is using here, and inspired by God, so that this would become a template for you and me, a template as a gift of God's grace that we can use and make it our own. Uh, isn't that wonderful <laughs> that God is even providing our words to help us to turn back to him? Like, that's fantastic. And it's this message of hope, friends, that, that sends my, my, my family and sends our friends and I to, to plant a church in Rigo, Quebec. And we want to reach people to tell them of that wonderful news that, of what Jesus has done for us uh, and that he is the, the only one who truly reconciles us to God, being God himself, offering himself on the cross. And he's the only one who will make things new one day where his happiness will reign again. That's, that's worth living for. That's worth believing that's worth everything. And I, I would be silly to say, trust in Jesus and all your problems will be solved. I've heard that before. Have you heard that before? Uh, trust in Jesus and all your pro life problems will be solved. Uh, but that wouldn't be true. You know, many Christians, including pastors, suffer from depression. And so once we enter by the way of Jesus, we also need to learn to walk the way of Jesus. And in verses 6 to the end of this psalm, uh, we see we give we have a bit of a of an idea of so, like three applications as to how we can safeguard this happiness and, and kind of push back against the tendency of, of depression by preserving by by reciprocating by reciprocating our relationship to God. I mean, we God has has His hand over His people. He His grip is tighter than our grip. My faith is not in how strongly I can hold on to to Jesus but how strongly he holds on to me. And, uh, but I still want to reciprocate. I still want to reciprocate this relationship because that is worship. It's gratitude flowing out. And so how do we do this? Uh, there are three, I think, applications that uh, the end of this psalm provides for us. Let's look at verse 6, which says, uh, Therefore, let anyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you be, may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. So first, expectant and childlike prayer. That is the first uh, application, I think, from, from this, uh, this text on, on preserving this happiness, uh, this happy relationship with God. Expectant and childlike prayer. The Bible isn't naive about our circumstances. And in fact, it's in our circumstances that God says, you can find happiness in me. You can find happiness in me. It's in our circumstances. Look, in the, the rush of great waters, this is what verse 6 is saying. Uh, he's calling us to pray. 
and not even the rush of great waters can, can stop our prayers. Uh, it's not like a bad internet connection. I mean, the rush of great waters will not be able to prevent our prayers to go to the Lord. And so expect it in childlike prayer. Secondly, um, growth in godly wisdom. Growth in godly wisdom. This is verses 8 and 9, which says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and brittle, or it will not stay near, near you. Okay, so we have here, secondly, um, growth in godly wisdom. You know, sometimes, if not often, uh, you know, we are depressed because of our foolishness and because of foolish decisions and actions that we make in life. But we need to have teachable spirits before God so that we don't live as practical atheists, but live in light of God's presence, God's reality, God's grace, God's mercy. And this is what the book of Proverbs calls the, the fear of the Lord. is living in light of the reality of God, his holiness, his righteousness, his grace, his love, his justice, all those things. Okay, and, and this is calling us to, to, to grow in godly wisdom. And then lastly, thirdly and lastly, practicing the godly discipline of celebration. Now, we don't hear that too often, do we? Uh, but verses 10 and 11 call us to celebrate the Lord. Let's, let's read that. Many are the, are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord. And rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. How do we do that? I mean, there's, there, there are great ways to, to, you know, to celebrate the Lord. Obviously, Sunday morning is one way to celebrate the Lord, uh, God's salvation in Jesus for, uh, for you and me. Uh, and I would encourage you, you know, if you want ideas, creativity, I would encourage you to read Deuteronomy chapters 15 and 16, which, which give a bit of an idea of how the Israelites uh, celebrated the Lord uh, and his salvation. And, uh, you know, you see here in, in, in verse 10 that it's the steadfast love which surrounds us. You know, think of the end of, of Romans chapter 8, that nothing uh, can separate us from the love of God. This is echoing uh, what uh, verse 32 says here. And because of that, we are to be glad in the Lord and, and to rejoice and to shout for joy. Uh, and so, uh, you know, for creativity, look at, uh, at Deuteronomy chapter 15 and 16, which gives us good principles on how we can, you know, uh, celebrate the Lord. And what my family, just to, sh to share a little bit, what my family started doing in the beginning, I guess, of the, of the pandemic is that we started uh, these kind of, you know, the Khmeri version of, of uh, a Shabbat dinner. Uh, and so we just made it our own thing where, you know, uh, we had, you know, bread and wine and we read a psalm, um, Psalm 136 mostly. And, um, you know, we, we prayed and we broke the bread. We passed the grape juice and the wine and, and we remembered that God walks with his people in the desert. And that Canada is, is really a, it's kind of like a desert, a wilderness of some sort. It's not the new heavens and the new earth as much as there are some really good things about Canada. And that became very meaningful for us, very edifying, uh, because uh, I'm an amnesiac. I suffer from, uh, from spiritual amnesia, and I need very tangible things like a dinner and, and a reading of scripture and a song to, to, to call me to, to rejoice in the Lord. And so in what ways is, is God leading you to celebrate his work of salvation uh, on the cross? Uh, how is God calling you to do that? Uh, that's that's for you to, to find out. And so my hope with these these three disciplines that I that we unpacked here is that they will deepen your love and trust in God, who, the God who is near you, the God who walks with His people in the middle of a of, in the midst of a hostile world, uh, a wilderness of some sort, so that you can stay the course and enter the eternal happiness of God at Jesus's return. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace uh, that is with us. Lord, thank you that uh, you walk with us in this wilderness. You give us, you give us your, your, your presence. You give us your Son. You give us your Holy Spirit. And Lord, you, you, you are a God who doesn't leave his people, uh, but you are with us. And I pray, God, that you would give us a, a deep sense of your presence with us, a deep sense of your, your hand that is upon us uh, to, to call us back to you, to hold us when we are straying, 
calls back to yourself so that we can live uh, and, and glimpse this happiness of the triune God, the happiness between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and even experience it now. Lord, give us faith, give us hope, give us love uh, as we walk and as we live in this journey. And I pray that you would help us to to trust you, to to depend upon you more and more, especially in this year, 2021. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. I have the pleasure to share with you now just a little bit about the church plant and myself and just ways that you can be involved with us. Uh, I want to thank Pastor Jeff for this opportunity and and thank you for, uh, I mean, for, for tuning in, but also for uh, your encouragement, your prayers. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, so uh, just, to, just to give a little bit of background uh, as to who I am, because maybe you probably have no idea who I am. Uh, I was raised Roman Catholic uh, in Ottawa. So I'm an Ottawa boy, grew up in Orleans and uh, grew up in the Roman Catholic Church. And around 10 years ago, uh, when I was a music student at McGill University in Montreal, is when I gave my life to Jesus. And it was, uh, it was a huge contrast for me in terms of where my life was going and, and where it went. And uh, yeah, so I joined a church uh, in downtown Montreal called People's Church. It's actually an AGC church and uh, was discipled there for a couple of years. I moved back to Ottawa and uh, I got involved in move-in in downtown Ottawa as well as uh, uh, eventually started uh, an internship at Church of the Messiah, uh, which is uh, downtown Ottawa, and started studying at uh, Ryle Seminary as well in Ottawa. And I eventually I met uh, uh, Renee, who would soon after become my wife, and uh, we got married in t- 2017. We have two boys now, and we're very happy uh, with uh, just the... Uh, yeah, the wonderful family that, that God has given us. And uh, I've now, I've since, uh, since then, I've been sent by Church of the Messiah uh, to plant a church in Quebec. Uh, I am Francophone uh, of origins. That's my uh, native tongue. Uh, so, so, yeah, it, it just seems kind of fitting for me to, to go back to, to Quebec after being becoming a Christian there, uh, kind of going back and calling the, those same people uh, to faith in Jesus. It's, uh, it's a real honor to do that. Uh, I'm, so I mentioned that I was a musician. I'm also, you know, I'm still a musician, uh, still practice the French horn, still play, still teach. And I'm also a co-founder of the Renew Arts and Apologetics or Arts and Theology Conference, which uh, just had its second conference this uh, past November. So I felt called to church planting. Uh, out of all of that, I kind of felt called to church plant uh, in, in Quebec, and uh, just about, it was, it was a two-year process, uh, and it really started with, uh, uh, with a meeting uh, Pastor Jeff and Ruth, and um, having a good conversation with them, and them really putting it on my heart to, to go to minister to Francophones and minister in Quebec. And uh, not long after that, I had a dream, which was from the Lord, uh, in, a, in, in the summer, where uh, it just really was obvious. I talked to my wife about it, and we both concluded that it was the Lord calling me to, to, to Quebec. And then a few other occasions where, where that were very meaningful until, you know, the pandemic began. And at that time, I was going through Deuteronomy with uh, the youth group at Church of the Messiah. And I, I knew it as we were going through this, uh, this book that the Lord was actually going to speak to me probably more, probably most, <laughs> out of all of the whole group. Uh, and calling me to uh, to walk by faith, uh, to walk by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, uh, and to, to forsake the things of this world and, and hoping uh, in the circumstances of this world and walking with the Lord in the wilderness. So that was a big thing that launched us to, to Quebec and to make this leap of faith. And uh, through connections in my denomination, which is the Anglican Network in Canada, uh, so ANIC, uh, as we call it, uh, we determined that uh, Rigaud and, and St. Lazar was going to be the area where we would plant a church, which is, uh, again, between Ottawa and Montreal, about halfway uh, between Ottawa and Montreal. And uh, my bishop was very encouraging of that, which was very uh, helpful for us. And so we made the leap of faith. Uh, we bought a, a house with the help of, of some people and, uh, and were able to 
I mean, to, to move in uh, on uh, like two days before we had to leave our apartment in Ottawa and my wife Renee was pregnant with our second child. He was actually born the day after we moved. Uh, so it was a crazy time, but we felt the Lord's peace and presence like like we, there was no words to describe it. And uh, it was such a witness in the hospital just to see how everything kind of went down. And um, and uh, so, yeah, so, so that happened. A couple of weeks later, we uh, I started making the, the steps towards uh, forming a core group uh, via, you know, some contacts that we already had here, here in, in, in Rigo and San Lazar. We'd go for walks and meet with people there uh, through newsletters and uh, and, and just uh, soccer games and all those things when, when we were allowed to do that in the, in the summer. And uh, eventually we, uh, we launched. So on the 29th of November, we launched. And uh, our, our mission and our vision uh, are that uh, to, to, to see the good news of Jesus reach and renew Rigo and the surrounding areas. So that one day, uh, Quebec will be a light for the gospel to the rest of our nation. Uh, and I know that's an ambitious uh, goal for us to, to see Quebec become a light uh, to the rest of our nation. But I really felt like that was from the Lord for some reason, uh, to go ambitious in that way. And, uh, and, and, and you know, we, we just celebrated Christmas. Uh, we read the, the prophecy of Micah, uh, where a little town of Bethlehem, you know, out of that little town, there would be a ruler, a Messiah that would come. Uh, an unlikely place, a backwater place, uh, the, 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 the unsuspected place where the Messiah should come. People would think, you know, Jerusalem probably. Uh, but no, it was Bethlehem. It was, it was the humble place. And uh, we believe that, you know, Quebec is a humble place in some way, an unexpected place where, where a revival should take place. <laughs> so that's what we're praying for. We're praying through that mission and vision. And uh, on the ground, we, we want to help people rediscover Jesus to help them rediscover Jesus and the fullness, the magnitude, magnitude of his gospel. Uh, a lot of Quebecers have experienced Christianity or the church in a way that uh, exceeds what Christianity is and, and falls into politics or you know, just different ways that it's just not what Christianity is about. And an increasing number of people, of Quebecers, uh, have not experienced the church or Christianity at all. And so we're here with something new, essentially. Uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to share that with our neighbors because that's the hope that we have. Uh, so just over over Christmas, uh, on the 24th, Christmas Eve, we had a um, lessons and carols. So it's basically, you know, scriptures and, and songs kind of uh, interspersed for, for an evening of, you know, getting to, to know what is Jesus all about? What is this Christmas thing? What, how do these songs relate to the whole story? And so we did that, and it was, it was a wonderful time. And in two weeks' time, we're starting a French Alpha uh, online via Zoom. And uh, soon after, we're starting an English Alpha uh, Alpha course. So we're, we're hoping to connect with people that are longing and, and searching for meaning. And actually, this, this morning, I, I read an article in uh, La Presse, which is one of the, the big journals here in Quebec, that people are... Uh, people who are spiritual, and uh, the people who were spiritual in this uh, in the study that was made are are uh, mostly uh, Christian. Uh, they have done better in, during the pandemic, and so th these types of conversations are starting to happen more and more, uh, even in the broader culture, which is very encouraging. Uh, and uh, we hope to to be able to step into that as a voice of clarity, uh, as a voice of of hope. And uh, so, what are ways that you can 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 take action? Again, I'm so thankful for. Uh, Pastor Jeff, and uh, and for you, West Village, uh, for your partnership with us, uh, we're so thankful. Really, uh, it's uh, it's really uh, humbling for us to, to think uh, that uh, that you're you're willing to do that with us. And um, ways that you can you know pray for us, you can be in touch with us online, um, whether it's through the the email or newsletters that we send off. Uh, just pray for us, you know, that God would guide and provide. And literally guide and provide because we're 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 a new church. We're just uh, a month old, so we really need God's help in this. Um, please, if you know people in the area, uh, whether they're Christian or non-Christian, uh, who might be interested even in a in a alpha, uh, please connect them with us. And uh, you can do that through uh, email. You just go to our website, which is uh, resurrectionqc.ca. Resurrectionqc.ca. Thank you so much again for your time. I won't take any more time from you. I really appreciate uh, 
just your, your, your prayers and your partnership in this. God bless. Things have passed away. Oh, your love has stayed oh, the same. Oh, your constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that we thought. your son to shine on darkest nights and for all that you've done we will pour out our love this will be our anthem song and Jesus we love you and oh how we now
adore. Lord, only because of your love for us, your great love for us, Lord, do we know what love and life truly is. Lord, enable us to reflect your love back towards you and to those around us. Lord, you're so good. Thank you. Have a great week, church. We'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.